I think recording is started. OK, so. You can see my screen now. Yes, yes. Okay, so remember, um, according to. Rotated component matrix. All these numbers are loadings factors. The loadings should be more than 0 0.4. It depends on the what you call it, your study. Sometimes to be more conservative, some of the references mentioned more than 0 0.3 can be kept. So the point is that you need to make sure that there is no cross loadings. What does it mean cross loadings? If one items loaded into two components, suppose that here we have a component, the factor is 766. So means these items, item number 21, is loaded under two domain, two components. So these items is a cross, we call it cross loaded. The cross loaded items should be dropped from the analysis because they are correlated with two different components. So if you keep these items later, maybe you face with something called collinearity. The collinearity is an issue that uh, which can be happen if two variables are highly correlated. If the items that you are using in your analysis are cross loaded, then you have to remove that items. If items has a cross loading less than four or three, again, you need to remove it. If any cross load, if any loading is a negative loadings. Negative loads also should be removed. Actually, I put all this explanation inside your slides and the PowerPoints will be shared. Uh, with some other documents, uh, hopefully by early next week. I will prepare this uh, all documents and I will email you through the edX, right? So uh, the point is that we need to check all these assumptions when we want to report the analysis. But as I mentioned earlier, the number of components in SPSS defined by a very simple and I can say outdated rules. Why? Because when we do the factor analysis under extraction, as it can be seen here, the extraction is based on the eigenvalue greater than one. So in our data analysis, when we run the analysis here, let me to go to. OK, so now look at here. This table. This again value was very close to 0 0.10, 0 0.042 and the other is 0 0.96. Sometimes these numbers are very close. Suppose that if the second loading was 0 0.999, again, the system will not recognize it as a component. And to be honest, there is no statistical point under SPSS to identify and uh, what you call it, the, the significant number of components using this cutoff point back to our uh, yesterday discussion about black and white cutoff point, correct? Uh, it is not any more acceptable. So that's why the researcher, scientist, statistician introduced another analysis which is called parallel analysis. This parallel analysis is a method to define the best number of components that can be extracted during the factor analysis. Uh, 
Uh, where is it? I did not put it here, but no worry. So that's why I'm saying I have to up, uh, update uh, my slides a little bit. So if you search for parallel analysis, these techniques is a techniques that let you know to determine the number of components during the factor analysis. It's a statistical analysis. How it works, it's based on the data simulation, correct? In order to do the parallel analysis, SPSS um, has no any option to do this analysis, and you have to do it with other softwares. If you search for parallel analysis, stat, uh, as you can see here, parallel, parallel analysis is SPSS. There are some syntax. You can download the syntax, but it is very difficult to do the syntax. And uh, look at here, the parallel analysis and syntax. Uh, this is Monte Carlo simulation. Actually, it's based on the Monte Carlo simulation. As I mentioned, it is uh, a kind of simulation. The best and easy to do uh, even even if you search it, there are some other softwares that provided the what you call it this uh, parallel analysis. But the one that always I use is a stat to do. Under a stat to do, yesterday we discussed about a stat to do. If you go to a stat to do parallel analysis, under computer program, this is explanation. And as I mentioned, it works based on data simulation. What you need to do? First, you need to identify the number of variables, observed variables. Observed variables, for example, in this study was, we had 34 items. These 34 items, and how many samples do we have in our data? In this data set, I have 230 samples. So what I need to do? Under this program, start to do, I have 34 uh, variables. My sample size is 3.0. And then just leave the number of the iteration as 100. You can increase it, but it should not be less than, of course, it depends on the memory of your computer, because sometimes if you have too many variables or too many cases in your data, increasing the number of the iteration will uh, need more space in your RAM, correct? So, but 100 is enough. Don't make it too much. Just run it. When you calculate it, then you will get these results. So what you need to do, you copy this table, you copy these numbers from the stat to do and paste it in Excel sheet as a text. So only I just need to move this header here. Okay, so so means as you can see here in this simulation also we have 34 and this is the mean of acceptable eigenvalue and this is 95% acceptable. So what I need to do, I need to compare the eigenvalue from a simulated data, from 100 simulated data with my original eigenvalue. So now I just copy this column. This is from SPSS. And just paste it here. So now look at here. This is the eigenvalue from actual data for 34 items. I just copy this data and paste it here. I don't need any more. This one I just removed. So remember, this is based on simulated data. So I just put here simulated data. And this is the actual from your analysis. So what you need to do, as long as the eigenvalue from your actual data is more than simulated data, you can keep these factors. So now, can you tell me, in my actual data, the eigenvalue was 11 and simulated data was 1.9. So shall I keep these components? Yes. The second one is 2.8 actual data. Simulated data 
is 1.7. Shall I keep it? Yes. The third one, 1.6, 2.6. Keep it? Yes. The next one, 4, 1.6 and 2.1. Shall I keep it? Yes. The next one, 1.5 and 1.49. Shall I keep it? No. Okay, according to the 95%, I need to exclude these factors. But remember, the average is still, considering the average, still I can keep it, right? Because 1.49 is more than 1.48. So that's why still I want to be more conservative. That's why I keep it. So, but the number six, shall I keep it or not? 1.004. And the minimum acceptable is 1.48 and 1.43. Shall I keep it? No. So means if I want to do this data, if I want to do the factor analysis of this data, so I need to extract my data to how many components? Five components. Five. Correct. So if you search if you search for parallel analysis in the in the web under image, you can see always these charts. Look at here. These are the charts that always we advise to report it. This is the parallel analysis. Look at here. Observe eigenvalue by 95% and by mean parallel. So both of them can be reported. What I need to do, very simple. I go back to data, I select this simulated data, and then I go to analyze, insert into line, and then select the line. Now this graph, you can report this graph as an evidence of the parallel analysis. As you can see here, component one, okay, two, okay, three, okay, four, okay, Five is still we can keep it, but definitely six, no. So means the total number of components that we need to keep in our analysis is, is five. So what I need to do, I need to go back to factor analysis and go to factor. And then under extraction, I fix the number by five. And this five supported by the parallel analysis and then run it. Now I have new results of the factor analysis is based on how many components based on five components. One more thing that I need to mention here. When you do factor analysis, the cumulative percentage of variance for all factors should be more than 50%. Maximum, okay, some of the references even mentioned 40% acceptable. But to be in safe side, the total variance explained by component should be more than 50%. In this study, let me to copy this one. In this study, how much is the total variance explained by all the components? 59%, which is more than 50%. So that's why we can say that these results are reliable and valid. So means we have five components. And followed by that, of course, you can go and check the pattern. We go the pattern, we copy this one, this table. Let me to show you in Excel. So now, as you can see here, the first component, Second, third, the first component belong to this item. The third, the second component. Any cross loadings? No. But remember, one items, one items has no loadings. Actually, the loadings for this item below was below 0 0.4. Why? Because when I did the analysis, under factor analysis is under options, I suppress a small coefficient below 0 0.4. If I change it to 0 0.3, let's see 
what will be happen? Look at here. A steel number 19. Yeah, number 19 is how much? 0 0.394. Compared to the other items, it has very low lo correlation or contribution with the components. That's why we can remove it. Clear? Yes. So this is called component plot in rotated space, but only according to the three components, because we have three dimension only. So that's why the maximum dimension that we can draw the distribution. And, and another problem, it is, if I'm not mistaken, this graph is not rotatable. Sometimes in some softwares, you can rotate this graph and you can see the changes, but here we cannot rotate it. That's why uh, you don't need to use it. So this is the factor analysis supported by the parallel analysis. But there is one big issue. What is the big issue? When we do the parallel analysis in SPSS, the assumption of the factor analysis for the SPSS is normality of data. Sometimes if your data are continuous, quantitative data, that's okay. Can you see here? Look at here, the data should have a bivariate normal distribution for each pairs of variables. But remember, in many cases that I, for example, in this example, all the items questions are based on the Likert scale. The Likert scale is not a number. These are ordinal data. It is qualitative data, correct? So when, when you are dealing with the qualitative data, it is not advised to use uh, EFA because under SPSS, why? Because SPSS factor analysis works based on Pearson correlation matrix. And we know that Pearson correlation matrix is a, is, a, is a suitable way to measure the correlation among quantitative variables. So this is a common mistake among many researchers. Okay, there was no choice. But recently, to a statistician uh, from a university in Spain, they developed and they released a software called Factor. It is a free of charge software. So for some of you, maybe you attended to my last workshop on questionnaire validity. I already explained about this software. You can download this software from, from the Google, very simple. You just search uh, Factor Spain. If you search for Factor Software Spain, the first link. If you go to the first link, it's uh, this software belong to uh, Universitat uh, Rovira Virgili in Spain. Two, two developers are uh, Lorenzo Siva and Fernando uh, from the Department of Psychology in this university. They developed these softwares. And the last uh, release was 7th of April 2020. The point is that I'm not going to teach you this software. But very simple, I just want to review the options. So this is a very unique software and very up-to-date. SPSS for a long time did not improve the quality and the, 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 the process of the analysis under factor analysis. If I'm not mistaken, at least for last 12 years, 10 years, it was exactly the same. So this software, of course, you can go to description. What is this software explanation? All the, what do you call it? Fitting index, the characteristics, the general information of these softwares. What is the main menu of these softwares? And of course, how to read the data, how to configure the analysis, how to compute, and how, what is the output? And of course, the most interesting part, free download correct you do not need to buy it but 
The problem is that this software is not compatible with Mac OS. So means if you are using Apple or products, uh, I have to say sorry. <laughs> you have to buy another laptop or you can download it and install it on the other computers unless you install, if I'm not mistaken, under Mac, Mac we have dual boot. Dual boot means you can install a virtual machine on your Mac and then you can run the Windows under your Mac. Some of you maybe you have these options, but for those people who are using uh, Mac OS operating system, and th there are a lot of softwares that are not compatible with Mac. That's why some of the programmers, they install the virtual machine on their computer and they install the Windows. So it means they, have, they are dual system, Mac and also the Windows. Anyhow, it is uh, available. Demo is for training, and there are three versions of the factors, the latest one. Here is the factors, as you can see here, 2020. So if you need to read the data. And the point is here, bootstrap. This uh, unique, uh, what do you call it, option, uh, which have which are which have been provided by the the authors and developers is bootstrapping, especially when you are dealing with a small sample size, because for sample size for factor analysis is always uh, what you call it. We need uh, a minimum number of hundred. So this is the minimum sample size for factor analysis. Is the minimum number of sample size for factor analysis is it should be around 150 to 300. Don't look at these two reference. These are pro probably they mentioned 100 is OK, but to be honest, in the practical way, you will face with some problem and challenges. The rule of 150, the rule of 200, but definitely it should not be 100 less than 150. So sometimes recently, for example, uh, we are developing a questionnaire among some groups of uh, medical practitioners in a hospital. The problem is that the total number of subjects are very limited. So we cannot collect huge number of 150 subjects to do the validation and factor analysis. So what we did, we try to use the bootstrap. The bootstrap is a resampling procedure to, and to improve the quality of the analysis. It is called the robusting of analysis. So anyhow, this is one of the option, interesting option. Of course, beside this option, the most interesting part is here. Two points. First, using polychoric correlation. The polychoric correlation or tetrachoric correlation is a technique for categorical data. Look at here, we have Pearson. Okay, SPSS works based on that. Tetrachoric or polychoric correlation is a kind of correlation which have been, uh, what do you call it, developed for the categorical data. Sometimes you have a binary data, zero, one, yes, no. Or sometimes you have ordinal data, one, two, three, four, five. Both of them are not quantitative data. So that's why you cannot use the Pearson correlation. Another point, that you can look at this software doing the parallel analysis concurrently. So means you don't need to do the parallel analysis on the stack to do all in one. So means you can do uh, what you call it, the correct bootstrap using for categorical data and also the parallel analysis. Of course, there are some several items for rotation. This is the rotation and also the way of Extraction is PCA, uh, what do you call it? Uh, unweighted least square and maximum likelihood. All these things are applicable. I mean, I'm not sure whether, no, I have to read the data to activate this one. Anyhow, I just want to leave it for those people who are interested if they want to. And the point is that they, are, they publish a lot of useful papers. These papers can be used when you are writing your analysis 
when you want to look at the writing styles, the, the program manual, the teaching video, if you want to, if you're interested to learn about the video. If you're education providers, you will need a huge budget. Sorry. Need a time, and you so this is the tutorial video. For those people who are interested to learn how it works. Correct? I mean, it, it's a perfect job. That's all. All the references and of course, if you want to cite, you can just cite them according to the guideline. Clear? Yes. OK, so remember the factor analysis is I advise you to use the factor score. Look at here. This is one of the output. When you do the factor analysis is with factors, it will generate the result of the pilot as parallel analysis. And this is the advice number of dimension. So this system advise you better to uh, define your number of factors into two, three. And this is based on the parallel analysis. This analysis is dated for binary data. Yes, no. OK, so that's all for the parallel analysis. Any question for the factor analysis? And remember, what I have taught you is called exploratory factor analysis. So we have another kind of factor analysis, which is called confirmatory factor analysis. The confirmatory factor analysis usually can be done by some other statistical software uh, that can be used for a structural equation modeling. So like PLS, SEM, and AMOS, LISREL, QS, M plus, even R. So you can do the confirmatory factor analysis with those software. Clear? Yes, Doctor. So there is no question, right? OK, let's move to the next topic. I will talk about reliability later. Now, one of the interesting topics, because I'm afraid we have only two hours, less than two hours, and I have to cover two topics. Uh, never mind. Uh, I will do my best. So the next topic for today's talk is regression analysis. Can someone tell me what is the regression analysis? And when we can use and apply the regression? What is the, what is the meaning of the regression? Let me to stop sharing. And OK, I cannot see your faces, never mind. What is the regression? Any idea? 61 I mean, participants are here. What is the regression? To find linearity. To find the? Linearity. Mm. Can you explain more what exactly you mean? To compare two, two data that you can find a linear relationship between the two? Uh, not exactly two, correct? And we do not compare, actually. The regression analysis is, is a kind of modeling, right? In each model, we have input and output, right? Any other idea? Um, the relationship between the one dependent variable and a series of independent vari variables. So why you don't use for the relationship, you can use the Spearman or Pearson correlation coefficient. What is the differences uh, between regression and correlation? If you want to see the relationship, why you don't use Pearson correlation or Spearman correlation? Why do we need to run the regression? Multiple variables. 
Okay, one point is multiple variables, yeah. But even multiple variables, we can look at the correlation, multi multivariate correlation analysis. I'm uh -huh. talking about regression. Because regression to determine regression can confirm the causation. Yes, that is the point. Regression is a kind of modeling. Look at cause and effect relationship. You already knew what is the outcome and what are the inputs. Of course, we can run simple means one IV, one DV and multiple many IVs and one DV. So this is the point. Regression analysis is a technique, statistical methods that makes you able to look at the impact or effect a series of predictors on your outcome. Correct? Of course, one of the assumption, if you want to apply any predictors in your model, first you need to make sure that they are correlated. Correct, no doubt. That's why what you need to do prior to run the regression analysis is you need to make sure that there is a relationship between individual IV and DV. The term of DV and IV means predictors and outcomes, input and output. In running, in the, there are two reasons that we run the regression analysis. One is looking at how much the independent variables are able to explain the changes in dependent variable in a simple way. How much the dependent variable depends on IV? How many percentage? So we exp express it according to the percentage. The second way is to create a prediction model. Correct? Prediction model. We can predict. So, okay, can I ask you? Suppose that you are planning to travel next week to of, just assume that we can travel, right? I know that the travel is banned, <laughs> but suppose that we can travel to Langkawi next week. What do you do for at the, at, the, at the first time. So means you want to go for vacation and enjoy your time. What do you do? Hello? We make preparation. What do you mean by preparation? Check the weather. Oh, check the weather. How you want to check the weather? <laughs> forecast. Okay, forecast. You, you check from the website, right? Yeah. Okay, how, how it works? Prediction. How they, how they, can, how they can predict. The, oh, and almost it's very accurate. You know, every day I receive, a, a, what do you call it, a, in my handphone, a, tomorrow this is the reminder, reminder system that, okay, every day they inform me that, okay, tomorrow 2 p.m. is raining in PPJ. And it, it's happened. Plus minus 10 minutes or half an hour, right? So how it works. So there is a model, correct? And according to that model, they are able to predict. So this is the point. Correct? So when, when you are planning to travel, you search for weather and then you predict. And behind this, what you call it, weather forecasting, there is a mathematical expectation. There is a, sorry, there is a mathematical models. You input your variables and of course you are able to, uh, sorry, hold on. And you are able to predict. It, this model works based on the long, form, I mean, duration of data set. So means there are a huge amount of data. And then I can see my face in the <laughs> what's happening. 
So they collected data for a long time and then they develop a model with high accuracy for prediction. And then when you plan to travel, the system put all the information for last few days and then they can predict it. It's a kind of forecasting time series prediction model. Clear? Yes, doctor. So now, actually, this is, a, this, is, this is one of the application of the regression analysis. So we do uh, what you call it modeling, and then we apply the model for prediction. So in, for example, in faculty of medicine, one of my clients recently, she, he developed a model to predict the, the risk of some certain disease according to the some social demographic factors. For example, they collect some information from the patient, they put in the model, and then they calculated the percentage of success in operation for heart. So means a patient with these characteristics, if this patient subject to the operation, open heart operation, the percentage or the, sorry, the probability of successful surgery will be 10%. So avoid, don't do that. Clear? It is very important to understand the concept of the regression analysis. What is behind the regression analysis? So mainly we focus on prediction. Okay, let's go. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. The simple regression analysis. In the simple regression analysis, we have one IV and YDV. So just look at here, this is slide. If X is one, Y is one. Two, two, three, three, right? So if I just connect these dots, these points, then I can draw the line, right? This line has an equation. What is the equation? Y equal to X. So means by increasing one unit to X, Y also will be increased by one unit. This is the simplest form of regression analysis, regression model. Look at this one, one half, 0 0.5, two, one, three, one and a half, four, two, five, 2 5, 2.5, and six, three. So what is, what does it mean? So it means by increasing one unit in X, how much Y will we change? 0 0.5. Thank you. Half. So let's, Look at these two graphs. What happened? OK. Now, if I draw this line, insert, scatter plot. So this is the scatter plot, right? This is called the scatter plot. I can draw the line, add trend line. This is the line. This is the linear regression. So I can, I can, I can draw the line. So this is the line. And if I just put 1.5, so then, Now, if I draw this line again, another line with this, insert, scatter plot. So now, oops. So zero to seven, let me to change this one also zero to seven. Then you can see the slope. So what happened? 
what is the differences between these two graph? What the slope, right? So here the slope. If I just call B1 and this is B2, the slope B1 is more than B2, right? So in our slides also, we just can say that this is Y equal to 1X and here we can say 1 equal to 0.5X. So means by increasing one unit in X, Y will be changed by half, correct? So this B is called regression coefficient and it shows that how much changes in Y or dependent variable or output depends on input or independent variable. Clear? Yes. So what we need to do actually is actually what we are trying in when we, we when we do the regression analysis is we do we just try to calculate this equation. That's all. But the problem is here in the real world. The the line the dots are not exactly on a straight forward in the same line on the same line. So our data when we when we do a scatter plot. Our data are not located on a straight line. So means, and sometimes it is not started from zero. So as you can see here, at certain point, we have intercept. So that's why equation will be A, A refer to the this value when X is zero plus B X. So this is called regression coefficient and this is called intercept. So means when B is, when X is zero, Y has a constant value. So this equation, this function, if you are able to calculate the A and B, you will be able to predict the Y at different level of X. But the problem is that in the real world, when we have a data and when we do a scatter plot, we are not able to, to draw a line that cross a straight line because we are talking about linear relationship. Again, remember, I'm not talking about nonlinear relationship. In this, in this course, we just talk about linear relationship. Even if you remember general linear model, generalized linear model, most of the modeling techniques that we have is based on the linear model. Of course, as you can see here, we have some nonlinear regression analysis, but it's at advanced level. I don't want to talk about it. So binary, multinomial, many of these regression analyses are based on linear regression analysis. OK, so the problem is that when we want to look at the scatter plot in our data, in actual data, there is no line, straight line, that cross and pass all of your observation. So always there is a difference or gap or distance from your actual data with the line. So, and this is called error. That's why in my model, I will add another part, which is error. And the best line is the best line, and the best line is the is a line with the low error. So what we are trying to do, we try to optimize and find. This is these are called parameters, model parameters. So what we need to do and what we are planning to do actually is to define the best model parameters that minimize the error term. Correct? So look at here. This line, we have 
too much error from the line compared to this figure A and B. So of course, this IV can be a good predictors of DV compared to this model. We have much more discrepancy among the line. Correct? So this one that I explained for you last, as I mentioned again, so this is called error. I, uh, this is called deviation from the regression line or error term. And this is called a slope or regression slope. And this beta zero is intercept. When X is zero, your dependent variable Y has a fixed value. Not necessarily all, but sometimes. So the point is that there are many lines that can be drawn between this line. Which one is the best line? As I mentioned, the best line is a line with the minimum error. That's why we call it least a square. Because again, the problem, if I deduct the, the y is actual y, y hat is the y or outcome based on the uh, what do you call it line so some of the lines some of the observation are above some of them are below the total amount of the error the total amount of error always will be zero so that's why we square it so and we call it square so the best line is called least square. The term of least square changes and refer to this concept. So we, we sum up the square of error terms. And the, and the best line is a line with the minimum LS. OK, how we can calculate it? I don't want to talk too much. I don't want to talk about the, these are the references for those people who are interested to know pure statistic. Of course, this formula can be applied. But for you, I just show you in SPSS. Very simple. Let me to open data. Where is it? Hold on. Regression, okay. Okay, we have IV1, IV2, IV3, 4, 5, 6, and finally DV, dependent variable, right? And suppose that you want to see which of these predictors able to predict or, or significantly affect on your dependent variable. But before running the regression analysis, like all other kind of statistical tests, you need to make sure that you already meet the assumptions. One of the most important assumption, the dependent variable dv must be normally distributed. If your dependent variable is not normal, you cannot use linear regression. So no, uh, no skewness or outliers. Independent variables are not necessarily to be normally distributed. Even they can be categorical data. Categorical, ordinal. But if you have a category, categorical nominal, you cannot use it unless this nominal is a binary. Like gender, but you cannot put ethnicity in your model. Correct, but for the binary data, we can use it. One of the another assumption is homoscedasticity. I will explain it later. Your model, your prediction model 
according to the regression analysis will be valid if you meet all this assumption. If one of these assumptions is not met, then you cannot proceed with the regression analysis. Clear? Yes. Only one person always say yes. <laughs> so means for the rest, it is not clear, yeah? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Okay. Say something. Put something in the comment chat box. I, I, at least I can see some of you are listening and watching this video. I mean, the. Okay, thank you. Thumbs up. Doctor. Yes. Uh, what about if IV is a, a liquid skill? But DV is ca categorical. Can we still use regression? DV cannot be categorical data at all. If dependent variable is categorical, we have different types of regression analysis. Like, like uh, binary logistic regression, multinomial logistic regression, ordinal logistic regression, these are techniques that if your dependent variables is categorical. If dependent variable is, con is, is, is a continuous and normally distributed, then you can proceed with the linear regression. Clear? I mean, if, uh, for example, the uh, DV is predicting a diachronomous outcome, like yes or no, can we still use regression? Remember, the terms that you are using is not correct. DV cannot use the, cannot predict the IV. Always IV predict the DV. Okay. So, and for the linear regression analysis, DP must be quantitative, and normally distributed. Okay. Okay. No worry, as long as you just, uh, okay. Mention that it is clear, enough for me. Okay, La, so let's go back to the results. Sorry, to the SPSS. Now we want to run the regression analysis. We have two types of regression analysis. Simple, we have simple regression, means one IV and one DV, and multiple, means we have a series of IV, and one DV. This is simple linear regression, and this is multiple linear regression. So I'm trying to cover both today. So suppose that I want to look at the simple linear regression between IV1 and DV. So what I need to do? First, check the normality of DV. You go to the explore, put the DV, normality plot with test, and then run it. So let's check the results. The DV is normally distributed or not. Is it okay? Yes. 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 But we have outliers here. What shall I do? Maybe go back the data and remove. Are these outliers critical? Uh, not really. So remember, yesterday I told you, I mentioned that if the outliers shown by a streak, it's critical outlier star. 
if shown by circle, it can it can be can be ignored. But if you have adequate sample size, just drop it. This is the reason that always we advise students when you are going to collect data, try to make sure that you add at least 10 or 20 percent dropout rate because when you move to data analysis, maybe you need to drop some of the cases, remove some of the cases, correct? So this is the reason that always we advise to add dropout rate to your sample size. Okay, back to this regression analysis, what I need to do? Very simple, go to analyze, the data is normally distributed. I did not check the, the IV because no matter. And then go to the linear. Under linear, I put IV and DV. That's all. And then run it. But before running, I need to tell you two assumptions. Do you remember? I said that heteroscedasticity, oh, sorry, homoscedasticity, and one of the one of the assumption that I did not mention here is the normality of the residual. What does it mean residual? Residual means the difference between actual value and predicted value, right? So remember when we do a modeling, when we do a modeling based on our data, So this is my model. Suppose y is equal to plus. So now I know that my y, actual y, this is actual y, real actual y, is for example, at when x is, for example, x is three, my actual y is nine. So suppose that if I put x into model, the y hat, the y hat or predicted value will be how much? 2 plus 2 times 3. How much is it? Eight. 8. This is predicted value, but how much is the actual value? 9. So means y minus y hat is 1, and this is called error. So, in all data, we have the error. Look at here. In SPSS, under save, if I click save predicted value on a standard dice. So, if I just click continue and OK. So, now look at here. What is this? This is actual. What is this? Predicted. Based, this prediction was made by what? By IV one. So now if I click save as on a standardized residual and on a standardized predictive value. So now look at here at the end of my data. I have two things. So this number plus this number should be equal to the DV because this is based on the prediction of the model and the rest of the residual. So this residual should be normally distributed. This residual, according to one of the assumptions in the regression analysis, is the residual should normally distribute it. So look at here, if I just copy these numbers and paste it in Excel sheet. So now this is actual and this is predicted. So if I just sum up the, act, the predicted plus the residual, it should be equal to the actual value. Look at here, this column, this column, and this column are same. The model was able to predict this amount. Underestimate or overestimate, some of them under predict, underestimation. Some of them, for example, it was five, and the model predicted 506, overestimation. So the residual should be normally distributed when you run the regression analysis. What I need to do under linear regression, 
let me to unselect the values. When you run the model on the regression, under plots, you can see here normality probability for the plot for the residual and histogram. You can select these two. Beside that, beside that, to check this assumption, homoscedasticity, homoscedasticity, we can cross between prediction at X and residual at Y. So a good model is a model that keep consistent same level of error at different level of dependent variable. So no matter your DV is low or high. So the accuracy of the model is high. Look at here. Suppose that if I just want to draw and show you this model, suppose that this is your prediction value. Low. High. This is the Y hat. And suppose that this is the error. So what does it mean? So it means this model, this model is not recommended, is not possible to recommend it. Why? Because the accuracy of this model when the I, when the dependent variable is low, that's good, very good low error. But this model is not recommended, cannot be recommended when the dependent variable is high because the level of the error is high. So the best situation if I just search it and show you the graph. So the homoscedasticity, some people, they pronounce it by C, that they spell it by C. So now, as you can see here, this is very ideal situation. So no matter whether your dependent variable is low or high, the model keep consistent, same error. But look at this model. Look at this model. Let me copy image. So look at here. <coughs> when your dependent variable is low, this model the amount of the error is not same. It's same when it's high, but when it's moderate level, the model is very accurate. This model also is not accurate because it is good. It, this model is very accurate when the level is high. And, but the best is this model. The distribution of the residual is independent from the level of your pre the outcomes or dependent variable. So how we can check that? Very simple. We cross the prediction with residual. Continue and then OK. Now look at here. The error terms are very nice. This is the distribution of the residual. And this is the QQ plot or PP plot. Correct? Same. And this is the homoscedasticity. As it can be seen here, let me to copy this one and then just paste it somewhere around here. So now, as you can see here, if I ignore this, most of the error, I can see that most of the error at different level are 
almost homogeneous. So that's why we can say that here in this study we have homos elasticity. But if data was like this, then we call it heteroscedasticity. SPSS has no any test to check the significance of the homoscedasticity or heteroscedasticity, right? So if if you just search, there is some module recently, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I'm not sure, but I remember someone create a module, a macro, sorry, test SPSS macro. Yeah, this one. Not this one. <laughs> and also not this one. I don't know why. So you can go to this website and download these softwares, and then you can download it in your SPSS. When you when you open your regression model, then you can see here heteroscedasticity test by Ahmad. Let me to see heteroscedasticity by Ahmad Darianto. So you need to go to this website. If I'm not mistaken, this video will teach you how to. Okay, so here, site Google. Let me to find it. Uh, maybe I can find it. Ahmad. Is it like an extension, Doctor? Yeah, it is, it is a kind of uh, what you call it extension. So you go to this website, and then, if I'm not mistaken, we have to download the macro. So we go here, click here, and then this SPD. So this SPD, I download it. Download it. I'm teaching you how to install the macro as well, right? So. It's Save it, go to your SPSS, and then go to utility, and then install custom dialog. So this one, I select it and run it. Oh, the problem is that uh, my directory is not uh, allowed to this software to, so I have to change my settings. Okay, never mind. At least you know how to install it, correct? So you install from this website, you go to this website. I just search, I put this website in the chat box for those people who are interested. Search, paste. You install this, uh, what do you call it? Uh, download it from this website and then follow the video, right? Okay, when you follow the video, you will be able to test the significance, whether, whether your homoscedasticity is statistically significant or not. If there is a heteroscedasticity significantly happened in your data, then of course you, can, you cannot uh, install it. Let me try another one. If I download the SPE, And go back to utilities, extension, utility, custom. Yeah, actually, in SPE cannot be installed here, only SPD. But I don't know what's wrong with my SPSS. Utility, uh, install dialog box. Yes, no, the problem is that. No, I could not install it because uh, my computer uh, is secure and easily I cannot install any extension. Later, I have to change my setting. Correct. But anyhow, you can you can try in your laptop and do this uh, homoscedasticity test. OK, back to these results. Let me do. Done. 
and remove this one. And this is the video. You just watch the video and run the video and if you want to report it. Because some of the journals, uh, usually for homoscedasticity, we, we use the, we report it graphically, correct? Based on the graphical. So, but if you are interested to do a test also, you can do it. Okay, back to results of the regression analysis. Let me to remove this one. Now, when you run the model, first of all, the first table shows the, the model summary. What does it mean? This model summary indicating that how much of the, this is R square. The R square, it is called coefficient of determination. So the coefficient of determination, or sometimes we call it CD, this coefficient of determination, R square, indicated that how much of the variance in your dependent depends on your IV. So according to these results, if I convert it to the percentage, I can say that 48.5% of DV depends on this IV. So 48.5% of changes in dependent variables depends on this IV1. And as it can be seen here, we have adjusted R square. Usually adjusted R square and the, the, the raw or crude R square, if they are similar together, it indicates the significance of the model. Actually, usually adjusted R square, usually we report it for the multiple linear regression when we have more than one IV. So anyhow, this R square indicate, indicated that how much of the variance in dependent variables can be explained by the model. So the next table we have ANOVA. This ANOVA is different from the one-way ANOVA. <laughs> I had a student that when he reported his results, the examiner asked him, you did the regression, but why you did report the ANOVA? This ANOVA is not for comparison of mean. This ANOVA shows that whether this model, the variance that explained by the model is significant or not or this changes only because of the chance. So as you can see here, we have the SS and variance for the predicted value and then variance for the residual. You remember when I calculated the predicted value and residual, this is the variance and this is the variance. If the variance of the prediction is equal to the variance of the residual, means the model, the predictor prediction was not working. As long as the model is significant, so means the p-value of the regression model is significant, then we can generalize this model and we can trust to this model. But by how many percentage this model explain the DV? by 48.5%. And this 48.5% was not due to the chance. These two models only shows the, uh, what do you call it, the accuracy of the model. The next table is the most important table, the coefficient. Let me to put the model here. 
So this is the model. What is this? B. If you remember, regression equation was A plus B X. Sometimes we say that A plus B zero plus B one X. So this is constant. The constant is exactly is your intercept. And this is the B, the regression coefficient for IV1. So, at the same time, the system calculate the standardized coefficient. In a standardized coefficient, the system, the software, starts standardized all the variables and then and then run the model. In a standardized variable, all the model starts from zero. That's why, as it can be seen here, the constant is not available here. So when the constant was not calculated. So this is a standardized regression coefficient. So if I want to draw the model, if I want to run the model, I can say that dv equal to minus point two three zero plus one o five nine time iv so means if you want to predict the dv if you enter your iv here you will be able by 48 0.5% accuracy predict the DV. Of course, high, high R square is uh, what you call it preferred, but depends on the depends on the context of your study. So in social science, in management, in business, in accountancy, in many fields which are based on the human. The R square, especially when you are looking at a phenomena at, 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 into a dependent variable, which is multiple aspect, you cannot come with 80, 90 percent uh, R square. Surprisingly, just I wanted to share with you, I had a student in management. He used four predictors. When he did a study, the reported R square, for example, this was customer satisfaction. With only four predictors, he claimed that my model has 94% <laughs> accuracy or prediction value. So we know that the customer satisfaction is a multiple aspect phenomena. You cannot say that these four characteristics of your products able to predict by 94%. So obviously this is data manipulation. In the social science in management, it cannot be happen unless you have a lot of predictors. By one, two, three predictors, you cannot say that this uh, three models, three independent variables are able to predict my outcome by 90%, by 80%. Oh, this story is different when you move to the engineering, when you move to the science, correct? When I did my PhD, for example, my the accuracy of my model, all of my model was 99%, 98%. Why? Because I control all the factors and I play around only uh, independent variables. There was no any confounding factors. So in engineering, in some field of science, of course, the RA score can be high. In accountancy, in the business, in finance, the, the RA score of the model when they use it for prediction is not more than 10 or 12%, 15% maximum. In medical science, 
When you look at the range of the R square, of course, as I mentioned, it depends on the number of the predictors that you apply in the model, but it cannot be 90%, 95%. Okay, clear? Yes, thank you, doctor. Yes, doctor. Okay, good. Back to okay. So what I what I t t talk about, what 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 I discuss till now it is only simple linear regression. Now I just want to run the multiple linear regression. So to run the multiple linear regression, it's very simple. You just add the other IVs together, all simultaneously together. Put all them together and run the model. But before running the model, I just want to highlight this. There are two techniques when you apply multiple linear regression. In multiple linear regression, concurrently, you study the effect or impact of several independent variables on your dependent variables. There are two strategy, two techniques, two approach. One technique is called enter method. The other is a stepwise. Have you heard about the stepwise as enter method? Anybody? No? No, not At all. <laughs> it's okay. So. But no, no, wait, yes. Never mind. Never mind. So let me to explain something about research methodology first, and then we move to this part. Very simple, huh? So we have two strategy to approach in research. Some of the research are exploratory. Some of the research are explanatory. Exploratory Researcher just try, especially for the regression. Sorry, I just want to talk about regression. When you are talking about modeling, prediction, there are two types of the modeling approach. One is exploratory. We want to explore. We don't care which one is significant, which one is not significant. Even non-significant findings for us is finding. But in explanatory approach, the researcher wants to the researcher wants to produce or introduce a model for prediction. That's why we just keep the significant one in the model. We don't keep, we don't retain the other factors which are not statistically significant in our model. So in this case, we can use enter when you have exploratory approach, so means you want to explore. Look at here, I just explore it. So, and then I go to the, okay, this model, enter model. The R score is 72.5%. The model is significant, fine. Good, it is not due to the chance. Followed by that, this is the table that we need to discuss. According to these results, According to these results, all factors are significant, right? Yes or no? Yes. 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 So means, can you tell me which factor has the most impact on DV? Two. IV1. IV1. IV2. IV which one? First. The first and the second. These two. Okay, IV1 or IV2, which one has the highest impact? IV2, IV the second one. Why? Because, it is two. Because the T has the, the, the highest uh, value. Not exactly T. Oh, you oh, have, the to, beta. Look at the, you the have beta. to look at beta. So beta is a standardized effect. Look at here. 
based on unstandardized coefficient, you can maybe you can de define that IV1 is the most significant factor because the coefficient is the highest. But when you look at the standardized coefficient, the highest impact belongs to the IV2. So the reason that we calculate the beta is to, to be able to compare among the predictors. Some of the predictors maybe, for example, look at here in this study, let me to show you something. So what I'm going to do, I just divide IV6 by 10. So now look at the effect of IV6. If I run the regression analysis, now So the IV6, how much was the effect here? One, four, nine. So when I divide it by 10, as you can see here, the coefficient was almost increased by 10 times, right? But look at the standardized. How much is it? One, four, two. How much is it? One, four, three, very close, right? And this is because of the rounding numbers, because I rounded numbers by this PS, by Excel. That's why the numbers are, small amounts are different. So remember, because the standard, unstandardized coefficient can be affected by the measure scale. But unstandardized is free from the scale because we standardize all the predictors and that's why easily it can be can be used for the comparison the effect still the numbers are same clear yes yes good so the next thing when you have when you have a, what do you call it, a regression model, let me to do something. I forgot to uh, add some other factors into this model. How many cases do I have? 150. So let me to just borrow some of the variables from here. Okay, suppose that I have more than this. I have some demographic, my data also. I have the gender, income, education. So now this model is not adjusted for the demographic factors. So what I can do here, I can also do the regression analysis, it's linear. So I just remove all these factors and then I put these demographic factors in the model first. And then I can create another block for the main predictors. So means I have two blocks. So the first block, when you look at the results, I have two blocks. 
The first block is the effect of social demographic factors, which is not significant. At least I can say that this value, as it can be seen, let me to remove something here. So copy and then paste. So now if I run the model, so now look at here, the first model actually, this is called hierarchical modeling. So in the first step, hierarchy, we just put the demographic factors. Followed by that, we put our main predictors, correct? As it can be seen here, When I put the demographic factors, none of them are statistically significant except driving license. But in presence of the social demographic factors, as you can see here, IV5 is not any more significant. Correct? So sometimes maybe you need to adjust your model based on some background variable or some social demographic factors. But still, this model is kind of exploratory model. It is not, it is not a stepwise model. So as I mentioned, when you have explanatory model, we just look at the only prediction more predictor who are significant. But before moving to the explanatory factors, I just want to talk about collinearity. Or sometimes they call it multi collinearity. So do you know what does it mean collinearity? Definitely maybe you hear about that. But maybe some of you are familiar with that. What does it mean? What is the collinearity or multi collinearity? Can you hear me? Are you there? Hello? Yes. Am I connected? Oh, scary. I found I, sometimes. Uh, OK, good. Thank you very much. At least just remind me that you are there. <laughs> OK, La. so the multicollinearity happen when you count the effect of some variables two times, when the variables are highly correlated, when two independent variables are highly correlated, the collinearity is happening. Let me to show you something. Go back to these results. Suppose that I just want to change it. This is the never mind. I cannot change it anymore because here is. Let me to see. OK, never mind. I don't want to change it, but suppose that. I have another variable which is the uh, this is the ratio or something. This is something, B, you know, the BMI is a secondary variable, right? You calculate it based on weight and height. Suppose that I have a new variable, index. This index is made by variable 4 plus variable 3 inside bracket divided by variable 6 multiple by 100 divided by variable 5. Suppose that this is an index, correct? So look at here. Of course, this index, this index is highly correlated probably by its components. So if I put this model, this, uh, sorry, if I also add this index in the model linear regression, and also if I put the index here, so now, can I trust to this model? Can I trust to this model? It is significant, but can I trust to this model? No. No. Why? Okay, remember, 
one of the critical assumption and the most important assumption in multivariate linear regression analysis is, is what you call it that independent variables should not be highly correlated so means there should not be any collinearity if two variables are highly correlated the model will be subjected for overestimation correct so the model will be biased look at here i just check the correlation between all these variables so now, according to the rule of thumbs, if the correlation coefficient is more than 0 0.8, this is an evidence of multicollinearity. If I copy this table here in Excel, so now look at this table. The correlation between index, this is index. This is index. The correlation between index and IV6 is how much? 80%. With IV5, it is 81. So means this value, this index is highly correlated with two variables. So actually when the correlation between two independent variables is more than 0.8, we call it collinearity. And if there is any collinearity evidence in your model, the model will be some sort of overestimation. So what I need to do, I need to evaluate and measure the collinearity. In a statistic, in a SPSS, you don't need to calculate the collinearity based on the correlation. When you run the regression analysis under a statistic, you can see here the collinearity diagnostics. You just click on that, continue, and then OK. So the things is here. When there is a collinearity, as you can see here, we have two more columns. One is called tolerance. The other is VIF. Let me to copy this table again in Excel. So, as you can see here, in your results, we have two extra columns at the end of results. And this is for the collinearity statistic. One is VIF, variance. inflation factor and this is the tolerance tolerance actually is same as a vif you don't need the problem is that actually the one divided by vif is called tolerance so the vif the maximum acceptable level for vif there is different scenario but to me it should not be more than five Despite some of references mentioned that the cutoff point 10, but I believe that five is the maximum acceptable. Many of references, even for example, hey, mentioned 3.5 is maximum acceptable. But when you look at this value, the VIF for index IV6 and IV5 are more than acceptable level. Of course, because the effect of IV5 has been counted two times, one time directly and one time through the index, because in index it was involved. IV6, also the impact of IV6 is counted two times, one time directly and one time through the index. So we are counting the impact two times, that's why it caused inflation in the variance, and that variance is not real. So remember, when you do the multivariate, multi, multiple linear equation analysis, is, <coughs> sorry, you need to make sure that there is no any collinearity. Clear?
Yes. Yes. If there is any collinearity, then the model can be violated easily. I have, I have received an article that the researcher used the multiple linear regression, and surprisingly, he used the BMI with weight and height as a predictors. <laughs> but he did not, re she, I don't know, he or she, did not report the, the VIF. I said that this model is this model is overestimate has, has has subjected to the overestimation. Why? Because you counted the effect of weight and height two times in your model, and surprisingly, you did not report the VIF and collinearity index evidence. Okay, so now we go back to this story, explanatory. So when you want to do the explanatory model, we just need to keep the significant factors in the model. Any redundant model or insignificant variables can be removed from the model, but you don't need, uh, yes? You don't need to do it manually. When you run the regression analysis, you just use a stepwise. A stepwise regression analysis it's a kind of, uh, what do you call it? Several analyses and in each step, the name is a stepwise, and in each step, the system keep the most significant factors. And in the final model, you have only the significant factors. Suppose that if I just remove all these factors from the block and put it all in same block, Of course, I don't want to include. So I put all my predictors in one block and select a stepwise. And of course, under statistic, I just want to select R squared changes because in each step we want to see by adding one variable how much of the R square of more uh, in the model change. So when I run it using a SPSS, you can see here. So a step one in a step one. IV5 enter to the model. In the step two, step three, step four, so six step we have. The first model, can you see here? In the first model, only IV5 was entered to the model, and the RA score was 50.4%. And this model also was significant. So this is the first model. The first model refer to this. Second model, five and one. How much RA score improved? 13.5%. So means IV1 is the most significant contributing factors, followed by IV2, IV1, IV2 successfully was entered to the model. And the percentage of the variance is 4.56%. So the last variable which was entered to the model is IV3. And before in, in model five, in the model five, and all these RA squared changes are statistically significant. So means this stepwise modeling only keep the significant factors in the, what do you call it, in the model. So now we have the model one, model two, model three, model four, model five. Of course, we select the last model. And this is the regression coefficient and the VIF for the first model, second model, third model, fifth, and finally sixth model. So as, you can, as it can be seen here, in the last model, all the factors are statistically significant. Look at here. In the last model, all of them are significant. So means if you want to predict if you want to predict a model, a variable into your model, so you just need to run the stepwise regression analysis. By a stepwise regression analysis, you can create a predictive model without any rubbish information, rubbish variables, redundant variables. Clear? Yes, yes. thank you, Doctor. Yes, yes. And now I want to teach you, I want to teach you one of the interesting part in SPSS.
correct? So I'm, I'm sure that a bit maybe you are feeling tired, but please just a few minutes to teach you something which is really interesting for those people who are going to present their results uh, interactively and visually with animation. So in SPSS, uh, after this version 25, they added, they added this automatic linear modeling. In the automatic linear modeling, what you need to do? You just need to put your DV and then all the predictors here. That's all. Build options. You want to create a standard model or enhance model accuracy, boosting and or bagging. There are some several techniques. So uh, for those people who are selected, who are look at here, the selection of the variable is forward stepwise or best subset of data or include all the predictors. So I just want to do the stepwise. And this is the forward stepwise selection based on the AICC, which is one of the criteria to measure, to select the best and significant one model, the accuracy of the model for prediction, correct? So usually don't touch any things unless you want to play around and that's all. And then the model, uh, if you want to save the model, you can save the predicted model as another data set. Or if you want to export the model as an XML file, then you can save it also. I run the model. So when you run the model, so you can see this box. This is interactive box. You need to double click. When you double click on this box, you can see that this the the this the history. So first of all, this this is the target forward stepwise, and this is the importance of the factors. Oh, I put ID. Sorry, I have to go back. Automatic in the fields ID should not be as a predictors. So now the first slide shows the model, correct? An action taken, the trim outliers, the system clean automatically. And as you can see here, the most important factors, the predictors importance, you can you can you can just change it if you are if you like to change it. Uh, based on the most important factors, three most important factors, or four, or five, or six. So this is the predicted accuracy. It shows that all of them, this is the predicted and this is the actual DV. As long as they are close to a same line, it indicates so the, 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 the accuracy of the prediction. So this is the normality of the residual. And this is the sum of the outliers that have been excluded. The model automatically. And this is effect, the highest effect. So again, you can reduce the, based on the transform variables. And of course you can reduce the display based on the significance, based on 0 0.01, based on 0 0.005, based on zero. So you can play around the significance of the model. It's very interesting. <laughs> so this is another model based on the regression coefficient. So again, you just not based on the p-value. So you want to look at the, what you call it, the most important coefficient. Almost they are same. And of course, this is the estimated mean. And this is the stepwise results. The factors was transformed. The system built model based on the transformed data. So this option, um, without anything, so you just enter the model and just click. That's why they call it automatic linear modelings. Or the system the softwares optimized all the things that need to be done automatically. You don't need to, you don't need to kill yourself. <laughs> Clear? Yes, thank you. Yes, that's Okay, so I think 
I try to cover the most important part of the linear regression, and now we move to the last part, topics for today's talk, which is the binary logistic regression. Okay, do you know when we use binary logistic regression? Binary logistic regression. When your dependent variable is binary nominal? Yes, when your when when your dependent variable is a binary and nominal. Okay, I forgot to tell you something about the multiple linear regression. Sorry, sorry, I have to go back. Apologize. So remember, sometimes if, okay, this variable is ordinal variable. Income is ordinal. Education is ordinal. Driving license, yes, no, is ordinal. Zero, one, correct? So, but sometimes you have a nominal variables with, with more than, this is all ordinal. Sometimes you have a, a nominal data like ethnicity. Ethnicity, suppose that I, let me to create a numbers for the ethnicity. I, do I have ethnicity here? No. So look at here, we have occupation. Maybe the occupation is one, two, three. Government, private, self-employment, right? So this um, occupation is not an ordinal data. And it is not uh, what you call it, the continuous data. Can I use this occupation in my regression analysis? Definitely no. Definitely no, we cannot use it. Why? Because the numbers does not reflect the value. Maybe you put for government three, another person put one, no matter, this is only codings. So for this kind of variables, you need to create dummy variables. When you want to, okay, oh, I search in the YouTube, never mind, that's good. So when you want to create, when you want to enter a variable, another variable like ethnicity, occupation, then you need to create dummy variables. Means we have to create something like this. For example, insert, insert. So if the people, I sort it, for example, so for those people, for example, who work in government, I just create, this is government, this is private, and I need to create another one, is self. So now, so this person is working government, so the rest will be zero, zero, zero. For all these people who work in government, I create this one. For this person who work in private, I put one here, and zero here, zero here. So this is a kind of dummy variables, correct? And the last one, three is here. This one is zero and zero. So means I create dummy variables for all three levels. And then I will be able to include each of them as a predictor into the model. Clear? But yes. okay, so uh, but uh, of, of course, uh, of course, I advise you to go through the creating a dummy variables for regression 
there are many, many tutorial video, dummy variables, dummy variables, dummy variables, right? So a lot of people discuss about the dummy variables. The point is that, please remember my advice yesterday. These two days is only a starting point. And even myself, I don't believe that within two days I can teach you too much. And the efficiency of two days compact training, I don't expect to be at the moderate, even at the moderate level, on, unless you are a talent. No, that's different story. We look at the normal distribution in the midpoint. But you need to continue. If you don't continue, to be honest, you already wasted your time for two days. OK, so back to the last topic, which is the binary logistic regression. Binary logistic regression, as you mentioned, it can be done when your outcome is a binary data. Yes, no, dead, alive. We cannot use, actually, the concept is seminal, similar to the regression model. Only the outcome or dependent variable is dichotomous or binary data. Instead of the regression weight, we estimate the odd ratio into the model, correct? So um, let me to give you an example in this data set. Let me, okay, so this example actually is talk about, uh, you know, yeah, this example. You can, you can predict the, for example, if your outcome is a binary win or lose in election, uh, for example, a political candidate wins an election, you can predict some factors that influence whether a politician can win the election or not. And it works. Remember, in all the elections, I don't know whether you have heard about some uh, prediction models before, before the US election, some of them are highly predicted that Biden will be the winner, correct? So how they did using this approach? For your information, the binary logistic regression is one of the, uh, what do you call it, most commonly techniques and methods in big data analytics for decision-making process. In the decision-making process, it includes several steps. Correct? So, and, and, it, and each step, the system works based on the, this kind of modeling and then move to the next step. It looks like uh, what you call it, the cluster. Uh, and then at each step, the system define the decision based on the result of this analysis. So for your information, this concept, this binary logistic regression analysis is one of the, still one of the most commonly used techniques in, in business, in politics. <laughs> because most of the outcomes in this kind of, what do you call it, area are binary outcomes. In medical science, in medical science, you know, since I joined faculty of medicine for the last two to three years, uh, I have done a lot of binary logistic regression because mainly the outcome is the dead alive, <laughs> correct? So that's why uh, we, we do the binary logistic regression for this kind of outcome. But to be honest, I have seen some people, their outcome originally is a continuous data and then they convert it manually to the binary data using some cutoff point and then they use multiple binary logistic regression. I'm totally disagree. The reason is that sometimes your outcome basically and the nature of the outcome is binary. Dead, alive, win, lose, boy, girls, case control, no doubt. But when your continuous data originally is a continuous data, I mean your dependent variable, originally is a continuous data, please do not make it as a binary. Do not divide it. You know why? The reason is here. Black and white
that one of my students, my client, she measured the quality of life with a questionnaire. And that questionnaire gave the quality of life a score between zero, for example, to 60. So these students use the cutoff point, for example, 30, as low and high quality of life. Please listen, pay attention. That is very important. I just want to help me to avoid losing some of information. When we have techniques to deal with, with the continuous outcome, why we are killing and destroying and wasting our data? How? A person, suppose that a person with a quality of a score of one, below 30, it is low, right? Another person, a score of 29, still below the cutoff point, you, you both you categorize it as a low, low quality of life. A person with 59 and 31, both of them you classify at high using this cutoff point. Okay, no doubt, agree. But just ask answer to my question. These two person are similar or these two person? These two person are much more close to each other or these two person? Or these two person? What do you think? Is it fair that these two person with two unit difference, I categorize them differently, but these two person with 28 score difference, I look at them similar, same. Is it fair? Yes or no? No. no. That's all. So when your outcome is quantitative, continuous data, you know why people, they try to categorize it? Because they say that easy to interpret the logistic regression odd ratio. But when basically this odd ratio is based on the wrong procedures, I'm talking about logic. Yes, it is easy, but no worth. No value. Um, doctor. Yes. What about like those, um, like we want to categorize, maybe like a disease, certain disease, like maybe diabetic and non-diabetic, but the originated data is continuous, a uh, continuous reading. So we have to define, we have to like, yeah, the outcome is diabetic and non-diabetic. As long as the outcome is a continuous data, and we have techniques to analyze the continuous outcomes, my concern is that. This is a common mistake. I mean, I'm saying the common mistake. Many people, they do, they do this. And many journals, many high impact journals, they judge and they accept and they publish the papers with this concept. But I have a big challenge. Answer to my questions. Is it fair to look at this two person this same, but this two person differently? Just answer to my question. Yeah, I understand if, your concern, but like, how about like, like for the maybe, um, for example, for the diabetes, um, they have a um, general accepted cutoff point to categorize like this is diabetic patient, this is not. Then can we okay? So this if way? if you remember yesterday, I discuss discuss about it. So now you are right. You understand what you mean? Yeah. For according to definition. This is most of this definition are based on the old logic. Of course, no, no point, no choice. Still, you have to follow them. But I'm, I'm a teacher and I'm looking at the future. Sometimes we have to break the wall, correct? So who said that everything that have been done before is correct? The science is a kind of, what do you call it, a progressive, uh, what you call it process, evolutionary process. So we have to show that we have been evolved and we are still trying. 
Correct. Yeah, you are right. I understand. According to many, many guidelines in many, what do you call it, in WHO, in C NCD or some other organization, still we have to follow the guidelines. No doubt, we go, we go through. But meanwhile, at the same time, don't close your minds. Don't open your eyes. Try different techniques. So you say you say blood sugars, right? I'm asking you, just same as blood sugar. How much is the blood sugar to identify a person as a diabetic or non-diabetic no, or normal? For example, 110, right? So a person with 95 is not diabetics. A person with 115, you consider it as a diabetic, right? Okay. Agree? Mm -hmm. So the point is that we classify a continuous data. But as I mentioned, right now you don't have a choice. You have to follow the, the, the guideline, no one. But basically, if there is any alternative for you to test the impact of these factors on blood glucose level or sugar level, why we don't look at the continuous effect? Okay, so you suggest that you are trying the, the linear regression first? Definitely. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, <laughs> after this long story, so let's go through the, <laughs> the logistic regression. For the logistic regression, of course, we cannot, all, all of the outcomes is yes or no. If I, if I use the normal regression analysis, the error term will be like this. So means the residual will not be distributed like, so this is a problem. That's why they convert it uh, from, the, from the binary to the probability level. So that's why uh, we convert the outcome from one and zero to the probability. And then we, we do the, when we convert it to probability, it changed to the logistic distribution or S-shaped distribution. And then, of course, for the S-shaped uh, distribution, it is converted to the normal regression. I don't want to disturb you with this formula and explanation. But anyhow, at the end of a story, we can estimate the odd ratio. In the binary logistic regression, we don't have beta. In a, in a set of the beta, we have the exponential of the beta, which is called odd ratio. So let's to run the logistic regression. Let me to open this, close this one, close this one, close. So this is the binary logistic regression. But remember some of the assumptions for the binary logistic regression is still is same as normal regression analysis. Suppose that if we discuss, if you remember, we talk about collinearity. The collinearity also should be tested for the for the binary logistic regression as well. So this is a very simple example. When we do a binary logistic regression, of course, first of all, usually we advise researcher to do the bivariate relationship with the chi-square, with other tests to identify which of the predictors can be entered to the model. Um, it's called a screening phase. So after you screen and you find the significant factors at the bivariate level, then you can run the multivariate level. But Binary logistic regression. Can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. OK, so yes. in order to run the binary logistic regression, you go to the regression. We have two type of logistic regression, binary and multinomial. The binary can be run when your outcome is 0, 1. The multinomial logistic regression is a kind of extended binary logistic regression when your outcome has more than two level. Suppose that we have, we don't have yes, no. We have, for example, low, moderate, high, correct? 
So in this case, when your outcome has more than two level, then it is advised to use the binary logistic regression. In order to do the binary logistic regression, you click here. It's very simple. This is my dependent variable, admit. The admit is zero, one. Zero means fail, one is accepted, correct? So then you need to put your predictors. The predictors is GRE, GPA, and rank of a school. Two of them are continuous data. One of them is categorical, the rank. As it can be seen here, we have also same as multiple linear regression analysis. We have different approaches like enter method for exploratory analysis and a stepwise. For a stepwise, we have different uh, two, two methods, which is forward and backward. Forward conditional, forward LR, and forward based on the world value. Same for the backward. The forward is a concept that you, what do you call it? You add one by one and move forward. The backward, you put all and then remove one by one. So you just, it's a kind of reverse process. Sometimes results may be different in these two techniques, but both of these techniques are kind of stepwise regression analysis. Again, I refer you to the best teacher here, the help to understand the more details about the, what do you call it? If you just click on help. Okay, how can I hear? So, yeah, this one regression option, if I'm not mistaken here. Forward, backward, yeah. LR is likelihood ratio, walls, and conditional. I think should be here. This is the syntax. I think they changed the menu and then I cannot see the. It's no. in the methods. Yeah, yeah, the methods I know, but they explained more all these methods last time, but I'm looking for all the, 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 the definition and the backward. Okay, maybe you just search it, correct? In the internet, maybe you can find other pages, but definitely in the SPSS, I, I saw last time the details of all these things. Uh, surprisingly, variable selection methods. Always they change the pages and then methods sometimes. Yeah, this is the, yeah, this is the page that I that I was looking for. So now this is enter methods, a procedure for variable selection, which all variables in a block are entered to a single step into the model. Forward selection or conditional, a stepwise selection method with entry testing based on the significance of the score statistic and removal testing based on the probability of the likelihood ratio statistic based on conditional parameters estimates. So there are all, all these techniques, as I mentioned, the, the best the best one that always I recommend my students to use is forward selection. But the backward also is the reverse. The backward selection is removal testing based on the probability of the likelihood ratio statistic. Correct? So if you look at here under option, we have the probability for a stepwise. We, we select, we enter a variable into the model when the p-value is 0 0.05, and we remove it if the p-value is more than 0 0.1. So it's, it's a bit more conservative, but if you want to more sensitive, even you can play around this tool for removal and entry and entering to the model, 
you can say you can use the same or maybe you can just put both uh, for example one you can you can play around these probabilities of a step files so when you run the model let's to select the the, the enter techniques same as multiple linear regression you can also add more block correct it is kind of hierarchical regression analysis is you can add more block suppose that if i in the second model if i put here i can another model i can create more more blocks right depends on you but in this study we just use single block the point is here the most important part is here category call the category call under category call you can put only the category call your predictors here now we need to identify because it works based on the other ratio under category call there are two options for you to find the reference category the reference category can be the first or the last depends on you correct so suppose that I choose the first category as a reference, then I change it. If you if you just leave it as last, the system will use it as an indicator as a last. But I want to change it. Now continue, and then of course under option we can use the classification table: Hosmer, Lemes, Ho, goodness of fit test. This is very important. And finally, the odd ratio confidence interval the cpi exponential of the regression coefficient in logistic regression is called odd ratio so when you run the analysis this is one of the most important table so in my data i have only one categorical data as as it can be seen here <coughs> sorry <coughs> As it can be seen here, the first level, the first rank, rank, my rank is one, two, three, four. In my data, the rank, the rank is one, two, three, four, right? So in my data, when the system wants to use this categorical variable as a predictors, the rank one as a first category was considered as a reference. So means the top school was, was categorized as a reference and the other schools will be compared with that. So that's why in front of this cat 1000, zero, 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 the rank two was considered as code one, the rank three is code two, the rank four is code three. So that's why when we run the analysis is first, the system will randomize distributing the what you call it admission randomly generate some random numbers and these random numbers we expected always it's based on 50 percent right so as it can be seen here this uh, there is uh, the difference the difference between our data and a random number by 50 percent is statistically significant so means probably there are some factors that even without those predictors affects on admission, and we don't know that factors. So in the block zero, the system does not include or enter any variables into the model. In block one, the system enter the variables of the model. And this is shows that the model is significant or not based on the chi-score value. According to this, results the chiest score of the value of the model is 41.45 and it is significant so this is like model summary in regression analysis so this is something like r square there are two kind of r square cox snell and neglect so these two r square indicating how much of the prediction how much of the outcomes uh, depends on this model that we are presenting. The next table is the Hosmer Lemes Ho. This test can be valid if this Hosmer Lemes Ho test is not significant. If this test 
is statistically significant, you cannot proceed with the binary logistic regression. <clears throat> Clear? Yes. And, and finally, this table. So after entering the model, after entering the variables into model, this table shows the prediction. So if I copy this table in Excel sheet, So, as you, as you can see here, in my data, the total number of the total number of admission lets me to go back to data. So, if I do the frequency analysis in my data, how many people admitted? Two hundred seventy-three. And how many of them? Zero, one. So this is the total, right? I just copy these two numbers. So now look at here. 254 plus 19 means 273. So the model that we create was able to predict correctly out of this 273, 254 four of them are correctly still classified as zero. These two cells, these two cells, it's correct classification. And this is misclassification. These two cells are misclassification. Why? Because in data, 127 of them were admitted. But my prediction model only was able to predict correctly 30 out of 190, uh, 127. So means the accuracy of this model is only 23%. For non-admission, it has a good prediction ability. But for admission, this prediction variable based on the model has a very poor prediction ability. Yeah, the overall percentage accuracy is 71%, but we want to look at each, uh, what do you call it, prediction ability for both. Suppose that this is dead and this is alive. So, the total number of, number of people who are dead is 273. The model that I created was able to predict correctly by 93% the probability of death. But the probability of survival, which is 30, was terrible. Why? Because the model predicted 100 to, out of 127 of people Dead, 97 of them predicted as dead. This is misclassification. So this is very important table in interpretation of result of the logistic regression. Followed by that, this the next table is this table. The variables in equation. <clears throat> The variables in equation, look at here. The GRE and GPA, these are continuous data and they have positive effect. So means if your GRE increased by one score, you have almost 0.2%. You convert this number to percentage. This, If this number, if I convert it to the percentage, so means you have almost 2%, close to 0.2% chance to be admitted in the school. And when your GPA increased by one score, so means you have 2.235 times to be admitted in the school. Both of them are significant. But for categorical data, for the categorical data, as you can see here, this is the top school <clears throat> because it was rank one in the original form. 
in the original form, this was rank one, this was rank two, this one rank three, rank four. If you look at the test table, look at here, rank inside bracket three, rank inside bracket three. So this is a school rank four. So now, what does it mean? As, as I mentioned for categorical variables, always we need to set the reference groups. And this is the reference group. So this is the reference group. So what does it mean? So means if you graduate from a school by rank two, you have less chance compared to a students who graduated from a top school for admission. How much? 50%. If you graduate from a school rank three compared to the rank one, still you have less chance to be accepted and admitted in the school. By how much? 0 0.26. If you want to convert it to the odd ratio, what I need to do? If I divide one by this number, so means you have 3.8 times less chance to be, to, to be admitted. And if you graduate from a school rank four, still you have, because all of them are negative. So then you have a chance of compared to a person who graduated from the top school, rank one, you have 4.7 times less chance to be graduated. Let me to convert the first one also. So here you have almost two times less chance, 3.4. So look at here, what will be happen? If I change, if I change in categorical data, my reference group to the first, change it, and then run it. Oh, sorry. If I change it, if I change it to the last, because it was first. Now, nothing changed. The results all are same. But the odd ratio, the odd ratio now for the school is not less. So now the reference is the worst, the worst school. So means this is rank four, this is rank three, and this is rank two, and this is rank one. So means if you graduate, this number is still are same. If you graduate from the best school, correct? Compared to the students who graduated from the divorce school, you have 0.23 times more chance for admission. So these are the, let me to check the rank one. I have, I have to check, sorry. Yeah, oh, sorry. One is rank one. So the reference group is one. So it means this is three. So three is three, uh, one, two, three. Okay, so I made a mistake. So means here, this is the rank four, but this one is rank one, this is rank two, and this is rank three. So means if you are graduated from the rank one, compared to a school rank four, you have 4.7 times chance to be accepted. Can you see here this number? 4.7 times, same number. They are not exactly same, but very close. If you are graduated from a school rank two compared to the school rank four, you have 2.4 times chance to be admitted, to be accepted by that school. And if you graduated from a school rank three compared to the school rank four, you have only 20% chance to be accepted. So this is the way that we interpret the results. But please <clears throat> remember, the logistic regression also look like other regression models. 
has a lot of uh, what you call it uh, uh, advance and details that which is cannot be covered during this two days workshop. But I hope that you get the main uh, what you call it points of all these kind of statistical analyses. But of course, you need to go back and check the video. But the video, remember, is only for personal use. You are not allowed to share with anyone or upload to any social media. You can just use it for your personal usage. OK, so that's all when we are going to end our session. Oh, supposed to finish by 4.30. Now it's 4.42. Sorry, sorry, sorry. OK, any question? Hi, Dr. Can I have your view on the ordinary uh, regression for liquor scale data? Actually, it's same. It's same as binary logistic regression. You can find it, the ordinal logistic regression, as, a, as you can see here. The concept, again, is based on the same uh, odd ratio. You can run the analyze uh, regression. The ordinal regression analysis is, again, you can put your factors, categorical data here, and continuous predictors here. And then, you can set the time, I mean, the, the options. Don't change the options, actually, if I'm not mistaken, the outputs. What you need to do, uh, we need to just, uh, yeah, these two tests should be, oh, sorry, sorry. So test of the parallel line should be tested for the categorical data. and But the outcome will be interpreted based on same as the logistic regression. But of course, um, it was not under my topics for this workshop, uh, but the concept of the regression is still is same even under ordinal regression analysis. Okay, yes, you will get the, the you will get the slides and some references as I mentioned soon. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud, can I ask if my dependent variable, which is continuous, but not normally distributed. So just now you mentioned you should not use linear regression. Then so is you, there have any... use, you have to use the GLZ, generalized linear model. Right. Okay. Thank you. Hello, doctor. Yes. I'm sorry to ask an uh, uh, extra question regarding my study. Yesterday, I asked about you the pilot study uh, regarding to the intervention study. Uh, you mentioned that I cannot use any inferential statistic analysis. But no, how can I do it, doctor? The process. Just, just use the effect size. Uh, the same, the, go to analyze and the same process. But, but only calculate the effect size. Only see the effect size. Uh, uh, and today you showed that uh, uh, different levels of effect size uh, uh, regarding to that uh, that uh, report and the result. I I use it in my pilot study. Yes, definitely. You have to report it under pilot study, and mention that since the sample size was not adequate. You did not do any statistical test. OK, thank you, doctor. OK, thank you all. Um, I hope that you enjoy for these two compact days workshop. That's and <laughs> probably it was a bit boring for some of you. I apologize if there was any shortage in my presentation, my explanation. And remember, nobody's perfect and uh, uh, hope to see you soon in the new workshops in the in the new uh, in the new topics and advanced topics i hope uh, wishing you all the best and stay safe take care goodbye thank you thank you thank you, thank you so much thank you, thank you doctor